This is the Dr. Berg Show. Live from the nation's capital, it's time to get healthy, lose weight, and feel great. Call now to speak with Dr. Berg at 866-561-4292. And now, Dr. Eric Berg. Hi guys, welcome back. It's, it's just before the new year and uh, we have Karen over here. Say hello, Karen. Hello, Karen. <laughs> Good, so we're gonna answer questions on social media and take your questions. You can call in if you wanna call in. The number is 866-561-4292. We have a ton of callers been waiting for a while, so we're gonna jump right in and take your questions on keto and intermittent fasting and any other questions you wanna ask related to health. Hey, Dean, you're from uh, College Park, Georgia. Go ahead, what was your question? Yes, hi, Dr. Bird. Hi. Uh, I would like to know, I'm a 68-year-old female grandma, okay. and uh, <laughs> after working for 30 years, uh, I'd like to know, uh, I had an MRI done, mm -hmm. and I was diagnosed with a herniated disc, mm. And I heard your short video. My son listens to you every day. And I heard your short video on uh, uh, on the disc mm -hmm. and the medicine you take and the magnanase, uh, magnanese. Yeah. And I'd like to know how many you can take a day. Okay. Because I do. Okay. Good. So let me let me talk about that. Okay. So for um for ligament today. support. And I heard your short video. Oh, on, sorry. Uh, for ligament support, for disc support, for tendon support, manganese. Okay, that's the mineral that you need. So uh, I would get some manganese. You don't need to overdose on it. Just take whatever's on the bottle. It's a trace mineral. So it's trace minerals are uh, minerals needed in very small amounts, um, but you still need them. So I would also, you don't want to take any one trace mineral for a long period of time. So take it on a regular basis, but then also add trace minerals with it. So you want the whole uh, base. So I would take liquid uh, plant-based trace minerals with some additional manganese, and you're gonna be good. That's gonna strengthen your back, your disc, your ligaments, because these trace minerals actually work with protein. So they allow the protein to work better, and you can build it back up. So that's exactly what you need. All right, good question. Hey, Donna, you're from Atlanta. You had a question, go ahead. Yes, good morning, Dr. Good Bird. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to ask, I've been doing the keto diet since March and intermittent fasting, and I've reached my goal weight, and um, I want to know how to stop the weight loss but keep my A1C in line. Yeah, good question. Um, first of all, the A1C is going to be a reflection of how many carbohydrates that you consume. So you want to keep the carbs down. You don't want to start going to the carbohydrate to actually you know, maintain your keto. What you want to do is you want to add more fat and that way your body will start to burn up some of the dietary fat and not enough of your fat. If you're thin and you're trying to do this and you go low fat and you're doing lean protein and, and vegetables, oh my gosh, you're going to get really skinny. So it's really a reflection of <clears throat> adding more healthy fats so you're really satisfied and you have enough. For example, myself, um, I don't want to lose any more weight. So what I'll do, uh, recently I made uh, these keto bombs. Keto bombs are like healthy fat cookies and I'll consume them right after a meal and uh, I'll do like quite a few, but they're small uh, until I'm really good and satisfied and I can go a long period of time. In fact, the recipe is on my blog under recipes. It's called the healthiest uh, cookie in the world actually. <laughs> It's made with um, grass-fed butter and almond flour and uh, sugar-free chocolate and it's really delicious. So that's really what you want to do is add more fat but don't forget to add everything else like a lot of vegetables and these good protein but um, that's, the, um, that's the thing you need to add. All right. Hey Megan, you're from Georgia. You had a question about fasting blood glucose. Go ahead. Hi. Yes. Um Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I was wondering, um, I have, my fasting blood sugar has been around like 105 to 120. That's kind of my norm. And even when I go to bed, it'll be, you know, 110 or even 105 and still be that or be higher in the morning. And I know the liver has a role in that. And I was just wondering if you could explain that and maybe how to help with that. Sure. Hey, question, Megan, do you have any, are you, are you overweight? 
No, I'm actually um, almost underweight. Okay. Um, but I, my, my A1C is high, though. It's 6.4. Okay. And have you been eating a lot of refined carbs in, in your past? In my past, but not now. I'm actually getting ready to start keto next week. <laughs> okay. Good. <clears throat> Do you have any uh, fat around your midsection? No. Okay. No. I'm five, six and a half, and like 115 pounds. Okay. So let's talk about this. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The liver has a lot to do with this fasting glucose level. Um, there's something in your um, body that's called glycogen, that's stored sugar. Like when you, when you eat starches like potatoes, like a potato for example, you have a similar thing which you have these kind of stored glucose molecules in a potato, but in your body you can store glucose as glycogen. So you have kind of a similar type Thing going on in your body that you can use when you're not eating. So you, you run off the stored sugar and then eventually you'll tap into fat. So one of the things that you're running into is high A1C, which is an average blood sugar for like three months. So you're just, your sugar's basically too high. And now you're going to switch to um, the keto and intermittent fasting, hopefully. And the problem is your fasting sugar is just too high. So that does mean your liver is, is probably an issue. And even though you're thin, you may have a fatty liver or dysfunctional liver. And if the liver is fatty or dysfunctional or you have insulin resistance, it does not hold that stored sugar. So then now we have this blood sugar issue because you can't actually regulate blood sugars correctly. That's probably what's happening. So um, most of the stored sugar is in your liver, a very small percentage of it is in the brain and in the muscle, but it's mainly the liver. So the liver is really a key organ in regulating this. So as soon as you go on this and you start doing it consistently with a healthy diet, it's going to come right down. Everything's going to fall into place. Your blood sugar is going to come back to, uh, to a good range, like maybe 80 would be great. And so you have nothing to worry about with that. So, But the point is, yeah, you're going to be eating healthy to be able to restore the liver. You're not going to do keto just to, you know, fix your blood sugars, you want to do it to actually get your body healthy, uh, especially the liver. So I think you're, you're smart on that and uh, I would just continue with the recommendations that, that are on my website and also the video. So, and you'll be fine. All right. So Karen, do we have any quick questions over there coming in? Why are my questions always quick? <laughs> Why I do like my questions whole, have to be quick? I have a whole bunch of people. These people have a lot of questions. Well, I have a lot of people too. All right. But before anything, we have to give a shout out, right? to Timmy and Coco, adorable, sent us this adorable treat ornament. It says, the most loved couple on YouTube, and the, and the little penguins are Karen and Eric. So cute. And Timmy and Coco, Coco's eight years old, they are from Iceland, and Coco is uh, getting all the carbs out of her diet, and she's making the pancakes and the keto-friendly food and her mom is really proud of her and her mom Timmy's lost weight too. So we want to say thanks and we're going to we're going to shout out to Timmy and Coco all day long. Okay, great. So I have from Facebook, I have Nahid who's asking about large fibroids and keto and weight loss and have you experienced any challenge with people with fibroids or is it yeah. is workable? Okay. So one thing you have to know about fibroids it's a tumor and and by the way, anything that I say today is a, it's for your education. It's not meant to diagnose you or replace your medical uh, doctor's advice. So it's for you to do research and you're in entertainment, okay? So I'm not going to claim any to cure anything, illnesses. But that being said, a fibroid um, will grow when um, it's fed <coughs> its food. And uh, fibroids and tumors in general are, are very um, hungry for sugar, okay? Even um, there's a PET scan which basically inject radioactive, this radioactive um, material in your body that goes through and it picks up areas of high level of uh, sugar metabolism and that's where the cancer is. So um, a tumor being more of a benign type of um, a situation where it's not malignant but which can turn into a malignant cancer, it's kind of like a pre-cancer thing, uh, lives on sugar. So keto Genic diets are the absolute best thing to do to get that under control. But on top of that, 
they're, they're very highly sensitive to estrogen. So if you, you really want to be careful about consuming foods with estrogen, you want to do organic. And you want to do um, iodine type things like sea kelp because iodine helps regulate insulin. And that will be the best thing for a fibroid in addition to intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. Okay? Is that good? That was great. Is that a good enough answer? I have another question. Okay. Yes. And um, this is from uh, Max Mood on YouTube. And the question is, how does a high-fat diet relate to building muscle? Well, <clears throat> it's not really the fat that builds muscle. It's when you cut the carbs out. And then what happens is you start stimulating the hormones that activate muscle growth, which is growth hormone and even testosterone. And the way you do it is you keep insulin down and you also go on intermittent fasting because that will also trigger um, a low blood sugar situation and then goes right into stimulating growth hormone. In fact, intermittent fasting, Karen, yeah. will stimulate growth hormone by 2,000% in Woo. certain individuals. Not in everyone, <laughs> but still it's pretty high. Sir. As compared to... Who? Who? Well, the studies mainly are in men, but... Um, yeah, I see so, what's happening here. Yeah, see what I'm saying? Okay. But in exercise, if you were to do exercise in, intensely, you're only going to stimulate growth hormone by 450%. So intermittent fasting is going to be the key thing. Now, the problem with intermittent fasting without adding more fat is you're going to have a hard time going from one meal to the next. So that's why fat is essential because it has virtually a very small effect on insulin other than just eating in general stimulates some insulin, but the fact that it doesn't mess with your blood sugars like other macronutrients, it's what you need to do. But just by sitting down and eating a bunch of fat, that's not going to increase your muscles. Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna to go to a question okay. from Sue from Indiana. Go ahead, Sue. Yes, thank you. For all I can remember, I have trouble swallowing capsules. They get stuck in my throat, sometimes for hours. Yeah, that's. That's pretty bad because sometimes they're sticky and then they get stuck there and you're like, oh my gosh, it's a, a tablet sticking right there. So I'll give you some tips, okay? Uh, okay. First of all, um, what you want to do is you want to consume the capsules with food. That's how you're going to get them down. The other thing is like regular water doesn't seem to work, but carbonated water is a little bit better because somehow it, that fizz tends to bring it down into the uh, lower part of the esophagus. So I would add food when you're taking the capsules. Um, and you'll be good to go. Next thing, if that doesn't work, just open the capsules up and put it in a little peanut butter and consume it that way. All right, Sue? Thanks for your question. Hey, Larry, you're also from Indiana. You had a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, my doctor did an x-ray on my knees, and I'm losing my cartilage in my knees because I'm a runner. And what foods do I need to eat to repair the cartilage? Good question. Well, Larry, um, if you want to build cartilage, um, there's a couple things you want to consume, but that's usually not going to make a, a real big impact. Um, with, when you're losing cartilage, there's a couple reasons why. You, of course, you have wear and tear, but you have also a chronic inflammatory condition that can occur in the knee as well. Um, so to reduce inflammation and help you maximize the growth of cartilage, which, by the way, revolves around a certain hormone called growth hormone. We just keep coming back to the growth hormone. Growth hormone um, is incredible for protecting proteins and also uh, stimulating the growth of uh, the connective tissue in cartilage and disc and, lent and tendons and ligaments. So what you want to do, the best thing is intermittent fasting. That is hands down the best thing and then the keto. Why? Because that's going to bring insulin down. It's going to enhance your proteins and your joints and not just the joints, but the muscle, uh, but it's gonna stimulate growth hormone. So intermittent fasting is what you need to focus on. Now, as far as what to eat, it just has to be a healthy diet of a lot of vegetables, including like minerals in there, trace minerals, probably some sea vegetables would be good, some high quality fish, eggs, all these really key nutrients, because you wanna look at not just foods to increase um, cartilage, but you wanna look at foods for overall health building factors and supporting your proteins um, versus like some people think well I'm just gonna eat a lot of protein and that's gonna fix it it's not gonna work because you're gonna if you have more protein than you can digest which is about six ounces per meal 
you're going to then stimulate insulin and then have a reverse benefit. So it seems to be a sweet spot with maximized protein absorption at three to six ounces. Maybe seven ounces if you're a big guy, uh, but not a lot. But then if you go too low, then you're not going to have enough. So uh, you want to provide the raw material to build cartilage, which is um, not just protein, high quality protein, but the minerals, potassium is very, very essential, trace minerals, and even healthy fats because you need some of the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K. So basically that's a long answer to um, uh, just basically doing the program that I'm recommending on YouTube, the books that I have, and you're going to actually do, you're going to be very successful. If you have inflammation going on in the joint, I think uh, stinging nettle root is a great herb to take as a tea or a supplement to reduce inflammation. I like that the best. Um, but other than that, I wouldn't do anything else. Okay, Larry, thanks for the question. Lehi, you're from Nevada. You had a question about your 14-year-old son. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Yes, hi. he's 14 years old and he's in his growth years. And we just wanted to call and see which foods and supplements or exercise or meals a day should we be focusing on to maximize growth. Do you, do you want your son to grow taller? <laughs> he does. Oh, he does? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of things that I'm going to recommend that because I work with a lot of people over the years and there's several things that you want to do. Um, you, I don't sell this. You can find it online. Uh, it's a standard process product, and it's called pituitrophin. Pituitrophin, after the pituitary. It's called pituitrophin PMG, okay? And you can just do a search for it. I would actually uh, have them take one of those per day. And what it does is it supports the pituitary. The pituitary is really important in supplying all the, the hormones for maximizing your growth. And I don't know if this is, don't, don't, don't quote me on this, but I've, I've put a lot of um, kids on this and they just seem to grow. They just start getting this growth spurt and even kids that are smaller, of course, you know, there's a limit to how, you can, how, fat, how, long, how tall you can grow based on your genetics, but it seemed to be every time I recommended this product for uh, these children, they just start growing. Uh, especially if you want him to sign up for the basketball team, I would put him on pituitrophin and PMG. But what, what would stop the growth of a child would be um, to have foods that are deficient in nutrients. Um, so all the, all the eating plans that I recommend and out of this book for ketosis and intermittent fasting is what he needs to do. He doesn't need to do anything different. You know, high quality protein, eggs, grass-fed uh, beef, things like that, um, versus low quality protein powder. Uh, a lot of vegetables, huge amounts of salad are all very essential. Healthy fats in the egg yolks, the avocado, the coconut oil, all really key. Um, I would also have him take a, a really high quality sea kelp because the iodine in there will also help growth as well. And a lot of the other trace minerals. If, if a child is deficient in iodine, they don't seem to grow. Their growth is stunted. So that's another really important trace mineral. But Pituitrophin, sea kelp, those two supplements, and put them on the program that I'm recommending, and I think uh, he'll do quite well. Um, you want to make sure he doesn't do the six meals a day, though. Just do three meals, really good meals. Try not to have them snack because that's going to increase insulin and actually inhibit growth because insulin is the real inhibitor of these hormones, especially growth hormone. We're trying to enhance growth hormone. Uh, I would also watch some of my videos on growth hormone because that's the hormone he needs to increase. Okay, Karen, over to you. Okay, good. So uh, I have uh, Karen on YouTube, and she says she did a water fast for five days, and on day four, her legs started to cramp. She yeah. wants to know if she should add salt to the water, but I think you're probably going to say something different. Yeah, if you're doing water fast, and especially if, you're, uh, if you have any type of uh, insulin resistance or hypoglycemic issues, blood sugar issues, and you start going like four or five day fast, your body could start um, utilizing, you might not have enough stored minerals basically because insulin resistance allows, uh, prevents the, um, the absorption of these minerals. So you're just, you're experiencing a loss of trace minerals. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, just electrolytes in general. Um, I would probably do the electrolyte powder I have to give you all the trace minerals which will help you. But um, basically what you're doing is telling your body you're not quite ready to go that long with um, fasting, especially if you get cramps. It's usually a potassium deficiency. 
Maybe go three days. Okay, that's what I would do. But yes, you do want to have more salts. That will help you. But generally speaking, cramps are going to be a potassium, maybe a calcium issue, maybe a magnesium issue. Possibly a sodium, but not always. Okay? You have another question? I do. I have Lori <coughs> from Facebook. Okay. And uh, she wants to know, will fasting help loose skin? She lost a bunch of weight, and now she has some loose skin. And somewhere she heard about pickle juice and coffee, and she just wants to know... Yeah, your if, advice. if you mix pickle juice with coffee, <laughs> um, no, that, don't mix those two. That's <laughs> going to be terrible. terrible. Um, but separately, pickle juice is really good for your, uh, your system, uh, your, your bacteria in your gut. It's a good acid. Coffee, on the other hand, is another story. But um, yeah, intermittent fasting is the, probably the best way to tighten up your skin because, again, out of all the things that stimulate growth hormone, which is the anti-aging hormone, and all the things that will stimulate autophagy, which is recycling of proteins into new skin and muscle and ligament, it's intermittent fasting. It's the thing to do. But now, it, she did the intermittent fasting and she lost the weight. So yeah. now she's got the loose skin. You want to keep doing intermittent fasting for okay. a long period of time. Yeah, in fact, uh, that brings up one point, Karen, now that you reminded me, <laughs> Okay. is that um, there's there's people that are get in, they want to actually start exercising. And so they, they switch to this keto and intermittent fasting program. And all of a sudden they start ex exercising and they get tired. They run out of gas. And so they do carbo loading and they think they need carbohydrates as their energy source. No, they don't. Um, what they need to do is do it a little longer to get into this point of true fat burning, a true ketosis where your body is fully adapted and you're not cheating here and there. You're consistently doing this over a period of weeks to the point where now you do a workout and you, you have tons of energy. Why? Because your body can easily switch to fat burning. It doesn't have to have this glitch in the system where you're just burning up your sugar and then now we have to, now you cheated or whatever, now all of a sudden it has to adjust back to the fat burning again. It takes three days. You're fully in there. You have lots of energy. And then you'll start seeing all sorts of really cool changes with your skin, with your ligaments, with your, the tone of your skin. Uh, you won't have that sagging skin anymore. You'll start looking youthful because you're in a, a real state of ketosis. Okay? Yeah. All right. So, hey, Chris, you're from California. You had a question about intermittent fasting and blood thinners. Yes. Go ahead. What was your question? Uh, yes. I, well, first of all, uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, I started keto and intermittent fast about three months ago. I started with the 16-8 fast. Uh, I have done a 22-24-28, and now I'm eating one meal a day that's uh, pretty high in fat, so I'm, I guess it's a 23-1. Yeah. Uh, so I have like an hour window. Um, so anyways, I want to try a 30-5 to five day fast, but I'm on a blood thinner, Elquis, and I'm on um, a high blood, blood pressure medicine. Now, I will tell you, I've lost about... 50 something pounds and my blood pressure has gone down uh, tremendously. So wow. I'm just wondering if I can do the, you know, and I don't have to take food. I don't have to eat food with the pills. So can I do a fast and without any problem, you think? Honestly, uh, check with your doc, but I, I don't think you're going to have a problem. I don't think it's going to be counterintuitive at all or, or contraindicated at all because, um, as you do this, you're fixing insulin resistance. So your arteries, the elasticity in your arteries, the epithelial cell in the arteries will start to heal. And so then the, you'll have more elasticity, you'll have less blood pressure problems, it should come down nicely, then your doctor can wean you off that stuff. As far as the blood thinners, I'm guessing you might have had a clot or something, or atrial fib, or why did they put you on that? Uh, blood clot in my leg and one in my lung. No, one of the lungs gone now. Okay. Hey, just as a side note, uh, Chris, um, I think you there's a, there's an enzyme called serapeptase. Do some research on that. That is a really good enzyme you take in an empty stomach to clean up any type of extra proteins that you don't want in your body, like little little pieces of sticky you know clots or whatever. So do research serapeptase. Um, I think you're going to find some great stuff there. And the, the one that I would recommend, I'm not going to recommend a brand, but you need it in higher dosages, like at least 120,000 IUs, okay? So take that. Uh, but as far as what you're doing, I think you're going to eventually come off the, uh, the medications with the help of your doc. 
and I think you're on the right path. But you know, if you're doing 23 hours in uh, fasting, you can see a lot of positive benefits with your body. If you can do that, I mean, there's nothing better uh, that you can do for your body unless you're, you know, in addition to what you're eating, the quality of food, nutrient dense food. So I think you're on the right path. I would just ride the wave and keep going, Chris. Thanks for your call. Hey, Tim, you had a question. You're from Los Angeles. Uh, go ahead. What was your question? Hey, doctor. By the way, you do a really great show. Oh, thanks. I mean, really enjoy it. You're very, very professional. Listen, uh, potassium, as you mentioned a lot, is very difficult to get. But I know that cream of tartar for a teaspoon is like 500 grams of potassium, which seems to be a lot. So I make a morning shake, you know, with the, the uh, kale and the spinach and all that stuff, and that's what I drink, you know, around noon or so. But uh, to add extra potassium, can I put a couple of t uh, teaspoons of that? Is like a thousand uh, milligrams of potassium in addition to everything else that's in the blender. Yeah, good question, Tim. Um, I, I don't like that source of potassium. I mean, it may work temporarily. Um, you can get a potassium citrate in a powder form. Uh, that would be a better form. I, I have uh, something called electrolyte powder that I use. It has 1,000 milligrams of potassium citrate, and it has all the other minerals too. So you're not just taking potassium. You're spiking it with magnesium, the trace minerals, a little calcium, a tiny bit of sodium with no sugar, and it tastes good. So that's one thing you could spike it with, or you could just buy some potassium citrate and spike it. But... Anytime you do one specific mineral at high dosages over a long period of time out of the normal complex, you start throwing off other minerals. And that's the only little catch-22. Um, I just don't like the source of potassium in, in cream of tartar. But um, that's, so that's what my recommendation. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Okay, Karen. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, all the Facebook users because that's uh, really ramping up and people really love Facebook and um, make sure that you share so people know that we're available on Facebook. And I just think it would be fun. Everybody should push the heart right now. See how many hearts go across. I just think that's going to be funny. But yes, we have uh, from Facebook, Dr. Yasir is asking a question. Does L-glutamate break the fast? Absolutely not. No, it's not going to be a problem. In fact, any supplements that you have are not going to break the fast. <laughs> you see it. They're and, all going across. And the other thing That's is that... Awesome. Yeah, you've got a lot of hearts going on there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, yeah, you don't have to worry about supplements. But let's say, for example, if it's a carbohydrate supplement, like like if you go to the GNC or um, Walgreen, Walgreens, sorry. they have um, like Insure or they have these glucose supplements. Well, that's going to break the fast for sure. And I'm not talking about that as a supplement. I think that I would not even recommend that. But the point is that if you take any of those supplements, it's not going to break the fast. It's not enough carbohydrate. So you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> All right, Shelly, you're from Washington State. Hi, how are you? Well, good morning, Dr. Berg. Good and morning. wife, Karen. Thank you for good morning. this important information. Good morning. Um... I'm 47 years old. Children I had a hysterectomy, a complete hysterectomy when I was in my early 20s. I went over 20 years without hormones. About four years ago, I had about 30 pounds of rapid weight loss. I haven't been able to put it back on. I have a lot of muscle wasting, loose skin. I'm trying to rebuild my body. I'm concerned about intermittent fasting. Should I just do keto till I rebuild my body? Okay. So question, the real important question, Shelly. What part of Washington State are you from? I live in East Winant. Sorry, you broke up. What was that? North, North Central Washington. Oh, uh, okay. Because I, I practiced in Linwood, Washington for six months, but it just rained too much. I couldn't take it. So I moved to California for a little <laughs> bit. Um, no, I live on the dry side of the mountains in Wenatchee. Okay. My uh, husband's from Oh, you're breaking up Sorry. a little bit. You're breaking up. Okay, so here's what you should do, Shelly. Um, if you're, and this is really common, you went through an early menopause situation because you had a hysterectomy in your 20s. And this is a really good question from any anyone who's watching going through menopause and you're female. And uh, what's happening is your adrenals now are going to have to 
take over, take up the slack of the ovaries. The ovaries are going in retirement, and now the adrenals have to kick in there. So many women uh, have a situation where now they end up with um, a higher fat ratio than muscle. So they lose muscle. Why? Because the cortisol goes sky high. And that's the nature of the adrenal and stress. So um, you can have to realize that um, it's going to take a while to build that back up. It's kind of like when you have osteoporosis and you have thinning of the bones. Well, um, atrophy is thinning of the muscle fibers. So you're going to have to build that back up. So intermittent fasting is going to be crucial to build that back up. And you would think that not eating as frequent, would you would lose more muscle. It's just the opposite. You're going to protect your muscles, grow more muscle because you're going to stimulate growth hormone. Doing the keto is essential, keeping the carbohydrates low, and having really good nutrient-dense things. And then, then you're going to have to add uh, exercise in there very slowly and gradually over a long period of time to start stimulating the muscle to get it to grow. And you may hit plateaus when you're doing this because as you grow muscle, it's heavier than fat. So even though you're shrinking, you're gaining more muscle mass, the weight is plateaued. Don't worry about that. Just go by your strength, go by your overall health, and just keep doing it because it could take up to six months to a year before you start seeing significant change. Thanks for your question, Shelley. All right, Karen. Okay, good. So we have Lauren on YouTube, mm -hmm. and she says this time of year her hands and her feet are always freezing, even though her house, her apartment is cranked up with the heat. So what can she do diet-wise that will um, change that? I know sometimes just on keto that can happen, that you can get cold, right? Right. Well, first of all, you live in Alaska, so you need to move down to the Mojave <laughs> Desert. <laughs> that will help you. Um, now, it's like, here, here's, here's the other thing that happens during the winter. Uh, yes, you have temperature changes. Other variables could be that you just start intermittent fasting. You are going to get a little colder. It doesn't mean your metabolism is slowing down. It just means that your body is adjusting to this and it's becoming more conservative. So it's, it's not generating or wasting heat. Uh, it's becoming more efficient, I'm sorry. So that does happen. Now, the other thing um, that you can do is start taking vitamin D because one thing you're not going to get now is a lot of sunlight. Even if you did stand outside in the winter and try to get some sun in your face, it's not going to happen. You're not going to get enough vitamin D. So you want to start taking in a supplement to start to bring back in what you're missing from the winter. And that hormonally is going to help you warm up a little bit. So, because if you're vitamin D deficient, you will get cold. Okay, Karen? Okay, I have another one. And we have to say again, just in case they're, they're uh, watching from Iceland, Timmy and Coco, thank you. Coco's eight years old and she's learning how to eat right by watching Dr. Berg and using our recipes to make pancakes and things like that. So, good job, girl. Keep it going. Um, so we have on Facebook, Sandra is asking, is all of this information in your book? <laughs> no, only, in, only partially it's in my book. No. Um, <laughs> just want to show you, this is, if you go to the website, these two come together. You can get an Amazon, but you don't get this. Uh, you have to get this separately. So. This is a really quick way to jump in and just learn the basics. Has pictures, takes 45 minutes. Read this, study it, start. Then fill in the blank with this right here. This book has a lot of information. It's a new updated. Uh, recently, and this brings up a point, I just uh, did a seminar on every single chapter. It's 19 chapters. That took me a long time. Mm -hmm. That's an exciting. Because that's an exciting product. Because I had to read this book again, and I actually was quite impressed. I was like, "Wow, this is a pretty good book." Um, <laughs> you, read lot, your, you read your book. Yeah, it was it was that's a lot of great data awesome. in here because it took me seven years to initially create this, and then another thousand hours to upgrade it. But then to read it again, I was like, "Boy, if someone actually read this, they would get a lot of great data." Um, <laughs> I should, I should you read should it. read it. I should read 157 it. 157 images. I'm waiting for the movie. Well, I have it on video now. Okay. But this, this, I haven't like it's going to be like a new product. It's um, Tell not, about it. not that expensive. You, can, I'm not going to post it quite yet. It'll probably, um, probably on the first or the second of January, it'll be ready. Maybe it'll be ready tomorrow. I don't know. But <laughs> it's it's coming up real soon. But it comes with a USB, and you'll be able to download the files. Uh, the audio files onto your cell phone. You can listen to it when you're 
um, when walking, you're driving, driving, you're walking, yeah. you can hear Dr. Berg you can hear me. in the noggin 24-7. You so, could have one of those little pillow microphones. Then so what you could sleeping. do is you can actually have access to the videos as well online. So you can watch all the different uh, chapters and the summary of all the different things that you need to focus on for those of you that want to watch it. But the audio is cool. Now, it does just go to Android, but you can get a little adapter for $5, which we also sell. And then you can watch it on your iPhone. So that way you can have different ways to access the audio, which is going to be very cool. So that's kind of a new thing that uh, it's going to come down the pike. So be um, awesome. stay tuned. Um, but I hope you appreciate it because that took a long time to do those videos. <laughs> um, a thousand yeah. hours. Yeah. It's a thousand hours. So we're going to go to uh, Gail from Fair Oaks, Indiana. You had a question. Go ahead. Yay! <laughs> Good morning, Karen. Good morning, Dr. Burke. I am so, I am so just, uh, I'm excited. I've been following you all for so long. Um, so this past year, I went from 289 down to 208. What? Yay! Yeah. Wow. Um, so, Congratulations. So I'm really excited, but we have come against two situations. Two, I have two questions, if I could. The first one is, I am a truck driver. I'm 48 years old. I have great health. And my salads, I pack them big, just like you say. Mm -hmm. And I bring my little tuna packets. And all my delicious toppings for my salad, it's a good salad. And in three or four days, it's all rotten. And I'm mm -hmm. out there for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And so all my money goes down the drain, and I'm stuck eating these fake hamburger patties at these truck stops because I don't know what else I'm going to eat. Are you saying that the truck stops don't have huge salad bars? Is that what you're trying Sometimes to say? Sometimes they have. <laughs> what I'm saying is their yeah. salads consist of iceberg lettuce. Unless you find the subway, and then you can be like, I can say, can I get three quarters spinach and one quarter iceberg? Got That's it. the best salad I can get when I'm on the road, generally speaking. Speaking. So yes. I, I have a question. Um, is it possible that you can put some type of mini refrigerator or freezer in your truck? I don't know. Absolutely, we do. My okay. partner and I, we okay, both good. do. Um, but it just doesn't keep. Well, so the, I know the capsules you have. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, here's the point. Um, yeah, you can use... Um, the cruciferous as a way to enhance and the wheatgrass juice powder, that will actually give you a nice boost for sure and you'll feel a difference on that. Uh, but what I would do is, if I were you, is I would pack your freezer with frozen kale, take it out, blend it with water through the way. Because we, we have a freezer filled with frozen kale and you can pack it down good into... Right, I've heard that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you, do, you shake, so you drink your salad. So that way it stores a lot longer. Can you have a blender though? Yeah, you can have a blender. You have electricity, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I, we can, I can. So do the freezer. And then the other thing that I would do is that if you're traveling around the country, um, of course you got the main roads and you got the truck stops. You know, and I know you're probably on deadlines, but maybe there's strategically you can plan out certain stores along the way that are bigger grocery stores that you could go to the salad. Maybe it's off the beaten path. Sometimes they have that. It might delay your trip, but what I would do is I would freeze that kale. If you looked at our freezer right now, it is just packed with frozen kale. That's probably two months old, and it's still good. You just put it in the, the blender, add water, put little berries, blend it up, and you can drink your salad for the whole day. But then, okay? Dr. Berg, what about also the wheatgrass juice powder? Yeah, yeah, you can add that as well, but you still need to have some salad. But so, I do know salad is very perishable. What about... What about making kale chips, like baking, drying the no, kale? No, because then you, you're going to heat it. You're, you're going to kill it. the enzymes. Okay. Thank you so much for following us, Gail. I appreciate that. So we, now we have uh, Rie from Tennessee. You had a question. You're a diabetic, right? Yes, I am. Thank you so much for taking my call. Sure. Um, I've been a diabetic for quite a while, and I've been following the ADA recommendations and End of September, I was uh, admitted to the hospital with ketoacidosis. And uh, as soon as I got discharged, I found your videos on YouTube, and I started um, keto diet 
immediately. And about a month and a half ago, I switched over to um, intermittent fasting with keto, and I've been doing once a day, eating once a day. And my blood sugar went from an average of 260-something to about 122, and I was doing really well. And um, about almost two weeks ago, I got up one morning, and my sugar was really high. It was probably about 170, 180. And um, I was alarmed, you know, because it's been down to 122 or even lower. And so that has been going on for almost two weeks now every day, and I'm still doing the keto. I'm still doing the IF. Um, I'm sticking really close to your eating recommendations. Um, You mentioned that protein, um, three to five ounces per meal, and I only do one, so I usually stay around four or five. Um, getting my vegetables, I'm doing your um, potassium, I'm taking D, K, magnesium, calcium, trace minerals, whatever I can put in there. Um, But my blood sugar is still high, and I was doing some search online. They were saying that sometimes your liver has an excess of uh, glucose that they dump out periodically, and I'm just wondering if that's what's happening to me, or is it something else that I need to address? Okay, good question. Also, I'm a, yeah, and also I've had a hysterectomy a couple of years ago, and I'm 50, one going on 52 here soon. Okay. So I'm not really sure if that has anything to do with it. What's okay. your take? Okay. Are you taking um, my wheat gra- uh, my nutritional yeast tablets? I'm not, but I do the, um, the unfortified lectin. nutritional yeast powder okay. that I got from Amazon. Okay, good. So here's what yeah. you're going to do. Take more of the powder, okay, because the, the nutritional yeast has the B vitamins. Uh, take like six teaspoons of that powder a day, okay? You can get them in tablets if you want, but just you can just do the keep doing the powder. You need a lot of that nutritional yeast. Now, in this situation, there's several things that I would do. You're doing great. Everything's good, but it still needs to come down. I would go get a test in A1C and really measure and see if your A1C is coming down. Um, also, is your waist coming down? Are you plateauing? Um, the fact that you had ketoacidosis means that you had some serious diabetes going on at one time. And in that, what that is, it's a very unhealthy way to get into ketosis where your, your pH is so acidic, it could be very da- damaging to your body. So you want to quickly start alkalizing the body because it's so acidic and you probably got through that fine. Um, but now you're doing a lot better. You're, pro- you're completely out of that situation and now we have to do to tweak it. So what I would do is I would uh, add more nutritional yeast. I would also add exercise into the mix. Exercise is another great tool to take your insulin problem to the next level. It'll actually help, um, help your blood sugars it will actually help uh, even reverse insulin resistance. It will help um, stimulate the muscles to work better with, um, to sensitize glucose. Um, so that's some things I would do. I would also add um, probably some sea kelp into the mix because trace minerals are really essential. As far as you having a hysterectomy or going through menopause, that, that's um, another little factor because probably either the liver still needs some work or your, um, your adrenals are really causing the spike in this blood sugar. So you may want to do the acupressure technique that I have online to help your adrenals, and that will help. So either that's going to solve it or supporting the liver with something like um, um, some type of liver nutrient type thing. You, I think uh, um, what would be a good liver nutrient? You can do the cruciferous vegetables. That would be good. Um, Milk th- thistle would be a really good herb to take. And then that way, you're either going to drop it that way or it's going to be the adrenal. I think it's your liver or adrenal that's still an issue because it sounds like you're doing everything else right. Okay? So just give it more time. Check those two things. And uh, <laughs> one last thing about the American Diabetes Association, which is incredible because they do not acknowledge this relationship between sugar is causing the diabetic thing. They're still undecided. Of course, they're sponsors and partners with the food industry and the drug industry, unfortunately. But in 1971, 
the ADA recommended about 40% of your calories coming from carbohydrate. But then in 1984, they spiked it up to 60% of your, your calories should be carbohydrates. So they went 45 to 60, okay? And then in, 19, and then in the 90s, they recommended that, they, they said, well, you can be more flexible and add a lot more uh, sucrose to this plan to be able to be part of that 60% carbohydrate. Well, if that's giving the basic information that everyone's filtering down, they don't have a chance to get rid of their diabetes. They're just going to be stuck. So now they're stuck with managing their blood sugars, with balancing their calories with, blood, with their medication, and then all the list of medications they're going to get. So unfortunately, it's very bad information, and, and there's the so-called experts. So sorry you had to go through that, but I'm glad that you have the truth right now. So thanks for watching, and I'm glad that you're doing better. Hey, Steve, you're from San Francisco. You had a question about Bulletproof Coffee. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm 52 years old and uh, started your ketogenic and intermittent fasting um, suggestions in October. I lost, by Thanksgiving, I lost 30 pounds. Wow. Uh, so I was doing really well. Um, I did break the, the, the diet plan over Thanksgiving, uh, unfortunately, um, but I got back on plan. Uh, but then I seemed to stall, I, like I plateaued. And I'm wondering, because I just saw a video that you put out about Bulletproof Coffee, that you suggested it in the beginning, it was good to extend your fast up until your first meal. But if I continue to drink some of that coffee between my meals, it, does that count as snacking? It depends. Am I sabotaging myself? Yeah, it depends on what's in the coffee and how much coffee. But yeah, if you do a, that's why I always recommend doing one cup of coffee because if you start adding more coffee, you'll even affect like all of a sudden you get a little hungry. What happened with that? You got the caffeine that stimulates the adrenals. There goes cortisol and there goes insulin spike, and now we we drop the blood sugars down and because we have a release of sugar through the liver. So yeah, coffee. Uh, anything more than one is not going to be good for your blood sugars. Yeah. Uh, um, does that count with tea as well if it's caffeinated? Yeah, that's right. Not as much because there's uh, less caffeine, but um, I do a, like a naturally decaffeinated tea. So, um, yeah. Okay. Because um, in between my meals, sometimes I drink a throat coat tea. And that's caffeinated. It's a licorice root. Yeah, so try to find something okay. that's decaffeinated. Yeah. Okay, thank you okay. very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Steve. And I just wanted to say, um, I want you guys, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, to definitely uh, share this information. If you're on Facebook, go to YouTube. If you're on YouTube, go to Facebook, because I have different information. I even have um, some new videos on Instagram, so you can go there and check that out. It's, it's just new content. And then I also wanted to bring up um, one thing that you may be interested in. I'm going to be starting on Facebook kind of a closed group that we can invite you. Um, it's going to be a keto and intermittent fasting lab where it's like almost like a research thing where we can um, try different things and share uh, different results. And if you want to participate, um, stay tuned because I'll give you more information real soon. But I think it would be great to... Um, present ideas for people to test out and then have a large group of people to try things and then see how it works. We can all learn from being guinea pigs. I'm sorry, um, just ex like being people that can participate in this. All right, so stay tuned for that. Karen, do you have a quick question? <laughs> if you have a quick answer. I have several questions. All right. Okay, so uh, this is quick. Um, Gall, I believe it is, from YouTube, asks, what is the healthiest sugar? Yeah. Well, stevia would be the, the best no, sugar. Actually, they're asking sugar. Actual sugar? Actual sugar. Which form of actual sugar is the healthiest? Well, that would be an, a, a simple answer, uh, zero sugar. But um, here, here's the thing. You have sugar that um, has vitamins with it, like sugar cane. Actual chewing on sugar cane would be the best thing because you're getting a lot of potassium. There's a lot of potassium in sugar cane. The problem is you, you, know, you probably won't get cavities and you probably won't even get diabetes, but still it's, it's not something I'm recommending. But um, 
Refined sugar is really, really bad. Molasses would be really, really, I mean, comparatively speaking, better. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go with uh, molasses. Okay, but not is that, your final, is that not your final answer? No. Well, I'm gonna add, <laughs> I'm gonna add to that, got, stay away from agava. Agave. Because that's like 90, that's worse than almost high fructose corn syrup because it has like 97% fructose, which will totally put you into an insulin resistant situation. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Right. Now, uh, for a quick answer, Facebook Cheryl is asking about melatonin. How do you feel about using melatonin to get to sleep? Yeah, it, the melatonin is a hormone by the pineal up in your brain. And, and the melatonin basically is stimulated by darkness, so it actually helps you sleep. The problem is when you take it long term, it kind of inactivates your own pineal. That's why I don't recommend taking hormones unless you absolutely need to because it's gonna, it comes with a package. Now all of a sudden you need more and more to keep, to keep the same effect. So what I would do is instead of taking melatonin, honestly, I would, there's, a, there's a couple um, things that I recommend on a regular basis and they're based, it's my products that I have. One is the, the uh, sleep aid formula. I take that, how often do I take that, Karen? Every day? Every night. Every, every night. Yeah, it's, I take one <laughs> I don't about watch a half it, hour so before. I'm not sure what you're about doing. About a half hour before I go to sleep and bam, I go right into sleep. There's no melatonin. There's nothing in there that's gonna make you feel groggy. There's nothing addictive. It's just a blend that I figured out really helps the adrenal chill out so you can drift off into a sleep. And I've went through many different formulas, so that's probably what, what I would recommend instead of melatonin because the melatonin, it works, but initially you're gonna take more and more and it comes with a package. Okay. okay, now that leads right into my next question. What are your thoughts, and I know you're not a medical doctor, and this isn't medical information, and this is all opinions and things like that, but what are your thoughts on hormone replacement therapy? Okay, my medical opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, here's, the, here's the problem with, and this is a really interesting question because um, uh. people say, well, I'm deficient in a hormone. I had a test, I'm deficient, so naturally I'm just gonna take hormones to replace it. It makes logical sense. But what they don't realize is the endocrine system is a very complex system. And as soon as you add in this hormone, this other hormone shifts. And also, hormones are communication. So the more hormones that you take, it's going to inactivate the gland that makes it, especially the thyroid. So if you're taking a hormone um, externally that your body's not having to produce, then your glands can go to sleep. And then now you need more and more to create the same effect. I'm not recommending it unless you've tried everything else and then maybe but it comes with a package you got to know what you're doing and the other thing is why don't why don't you just support the gland support the gland that makes the hormone that way you're not inactivating the whole hormone system and I'll tell you honestly the um, the endocrine system there's there's no one that that I know that just reading through all the even the endocrinologists they don't really understand it yet. They really don't understand it. So anyone says I'm an expert in it, well, it's so many unknowns, it's so complex. Um, yeah, they know some data, but the data that I'm using is um, as soon as you start taking hormones, you're gonna inactivate the gland that makes it. So that's enough for me to say, well, let's just try another way. Like why did it go, why do you need hormones in the first place? Why did the glands shut down? That's the question. And it's I'm a good question. To it. Okay, good. I, I know you wanna take a phone call, don't you? Oh, but I do. I have one more on Facebook. I think this is a good one. Joan is asking, she's been on keto for about four weeks. She lost weight steadily. She just recently, after breakfast, started to feel nauseous or nauseated and is feeling sleepy mid-morning. And she's not losing stomach fat. Okay. 65 years old. What is happening? Did I miss something? Did you, is she doing intermittent fasting? She's been on keto. Yeah. So that's a good point. She doesn't say she's doing intermittent fasting. She says keto. Yeah. I don't know. If, see, keto in itself is high fat, low carb, moderate protein. So let's say you do keto and, you're, and you can't digest all that fat. It's going to put a big strain on that gallbladder and you're going to feel nauseous. The nauseousness is the gallbladder symptom. So that's probably what's happening. So I would naturally give the gallbladder rest by doing intermittent fasting and that way you can eat less frequent and not have the situation. Um, now, what happens when you even do intermittent fasting, your body starts burning fat, and now all that fat from the fat cell, Karen, has to come through the blood and come out to the liver. So now, you actually have a lot more fat 
being processed by the gallbladder, and that alone can create nauseousness, especially if you don't eat enough vegetables. Okay, so if you actually, what I would do is I would add more vegetables, do intermittent fasting, and you should be fine, and then make sure that you're not eating unless you're hungry, because there's a lot of people that get in the fat burning, all of a sudden now they're not hungry at all, but they're still eating three meals a day or even two meals a day. I would go to one meal a day. Just eat when you're hungry. Well, it's hard too with social situations and the holidays and things like that. Well, so I understand. I'm that. just saying. I'm just. I understand. I'm just the messenger, right? Karen. Timmy I'm and just Coco the know what I'm talking about. I'm just the messenger. Okay. 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 All right. Now I'm going to go to Rola from Chicago. You had a question about the best supplements <laughs> for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yeah, um, I um, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome a couple years ago, and um, I did some reading on it. I know kind of, you know, what kind of diet I should be on, and um, but I just wanted to get your input about supplements. Um, and I don't know if this matters, but they did my fasting glucose, and it was 72. Wow. So I guess that means I'm the non-insulin resistant PCOS. I'm not sure. Good question. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, I like the fact that your blood sugars are, are that low because usually what causes um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which by the way, is a situation where your androgens are going very high, okay? So that's a male hormone, so you get facial hair, alopecia, alopecia which is hair loss, and then midsection weight. So what I would do if I were you, I would do sea kelp. That would be a really good one for the ovary and see if that helps you. But just realize what's really behind most cases of PCOS would be high insulin. So even though your blood sugars are that low, um, the doctors never test um, insulin, fasting insulin levels. So think about it. Let's say the blood sugars are low and you have hypoglycemia. Well, what do you think is happening to the insulin? It could be high, pushing the blood sugars down. So, you, so it's really still a problem with high insulin. So I would actually go get a test for, for fasting insulin and test that. And if that's high, then we know uh, you need to support high insulin with the keto and intermittent fasting. But also as far as supplements go, uh, chromium is really good. Potassium is really good. The B vitamins are really good to bring down high levels of insulin. So that's why I, I have a keto kit. It has the electrolyte powder, the B vitamins, and the wheatgrass. That's really good to support healthy insulin levels, okay? Thanks for the question, though. That's a really good question. Jennifer, you're from Ireland. Go ahead. You had a question. Uh, yes, hello. Um, following thing happened. Uh, my boyfriend and I, we went on the ketogenic diet. We are both uh, at the age of 29. And uh, after two weeks, uh, we both felt our heart going crazy, like the, the pulse, the heartbeat were very strong. Uh, sometimes it woke us up, we couldn't even sleep. We ate lots of vegetables, lots of kale, lots of potassium. We really made sure to, to follow your advice. But still this happened and then we got scared and we stopped. And now my boyfriend still has this, this like high pulse and I was wondering what did we do wrong? Um, how can we fix it? Okay. Good question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I just did a video on high pulse rate. High pulse rate can also come from a B1 deficiency. So you need nutritional yeast, okay? You can get in a tablet or get in the powder. Nutritional yeast is the best source of B1. That will bring the pulse rate down. It could also be low potassium. Now you're adding all the vegetables, which is great. So, but you may need to add pot potassium on top of that um, to bring that down even more. Uh, and then the last thing that you wanna check would be, um, the inability to digest um, some of the fats, which I know if it plugs up the gallbladder, that can also raise the pulse rate. So look at maybe cut down the dietary fats, maybe, or, or add, add intermittent fasting to space it out so you're not straining the gallbladder. Add nutritional yeast, add potassium. That should, that should help you. Okay, Jennifer? Dr. Berg. Yes. We have to wrap up soon, but I wanted to ask you about your New Year's resolutions. Is it, do you have, does the Dr. Berg dream for the future, is it always about nutrition? Is it about what lettuce you're going to buy? Well, my, you want to talk about my, new, yeah. you want to just like my advice on it? No. We well, want to know about you. Okay, so as far as myself goes, I mean, honestly, I, 
I don't have a lot of bad habits, so I'm not going to necessarily have to give up. What I'm going to do is mm. I'm just going to step it up with my exercise and really take it to the next level. Um, and I'm working on it. I want to be able to do a lot of pull-ups, sit-ups, all the basic things. So that's really my goal for this year. Now, I did bust my elbow, my shoulder, and that's really what's what I'm rehabbing, which is taking a lot longer than I would like. So let's ask, what would be your New, year, New Year's <laughs> resolution, Karen? What would what do you want to? Uh, look, looking forward to seeing you next week. That's a wrap. No, yeah, right. No, because we still have no, Derek. I, I think for my New Year's resolution, you know, I say this all the time. I'm not naturally fit. I'm not naturally thin. I'm not as disciplined as the good Dr. Berg. So I need to be more disciplined and um, be more disciplined with my intermittent fasting, I think, is the thing. And um, I, too. You know, we are working out now. We are getting stronger. And I want to do a pull-up. Uh, without with no, assistance. With no assistance. Without Dr. Berg pushing me up Without me holding up you up there? there? <laughs> no. I want to do push-ups and pull-ups. Uh, I just want to be really physically strong. I want to be leaner. So I think this, the key to that is um, I probably have to just be more disciplined with my intermittent fasting. I like that. Okay, good. And also we have uh, Steve over there is going to be starting. Steve, on, our producer. On the first. And We're Terry. telling him what Terry's already on the program, but he's going to be their... more. He travels a lot, so that's an issue. We tell them what their New Year's resolutions are. And then uh, what I want everyone, I'm going to take call, the last call from Derek, but what I want everyone to do, if you wouldn't mind, is type in the comment below what you're going to do as your yeah. New Year's resolution. I want and to know about it. I'm, we're going to read all the comments today. Top so, it off with a lot of hearts, because yeah. that was awesome. Facebook rocked the hearts. That was hysterical. Okay, Derek, you're from New York. Go ahead. You had a question. Dr. Burke, thank you very much, and uh, happy, healthy New Year to you and Karen as well. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Berg, I, I spoke to you actually last week in regards to my situation. Um, I'm, I'm not on uh, the keto or the intermittent fasting, and that's due to just what I'm going through. I do have your book. Uh, I do have the gallbladder formula, uh, wheatgrass. Um, I have a gallbladder situation that just manifested recently, mm -hmm. uh, some sludge in the gallbladder. Now, you told me to take some bile salts, but and I do have your gallbladder formula along with some other bile salts other people gave me. Now, I'm, I'm not really thinking of taking that, but I wanted to get your advice. Uh, I do have some um, minimal erosive uh, uh, in, in, in the duodenum and uh, uh, minimal erosive and tritus. Uh, I, I do have your wheatgrass. I just started uh, drinking that uh, just for the stomach lining. I also do bone broth for that. But my main issue with the gallbladder is that I feel like I, I've been constipated and I feel like that's really what what's kind of backing me up. And in a video that you did where you say it's kind of like the chicken or the egg, um, where constipation can cause, you know, a congested gallbladder or uh, bile deficiency could be the reason of, uh, you know, the constipation because it lubricates the colon. So yeah. I, I kind of need help here, and I, don't, I also don't know what to eat. Um, yeah. I, I also been on a low-fat, low-calorie diet, which is not good, but um, my meals are basically, you know, I'm trying to kind of do something like like your program, uh, but it's not really there. I, I don't know if I can eat eggs, avocados, because I heard that could be uh, yeah. symptomatic for people. Um, so I'm eating basically salad with salmon, uh, you know, three times a day. I was I was using chicken and turkey, um, not turkey, you know, like real turkey, organic, everything organic. Um, yeah. I just don't know what to do, Dr. Okay, let Berg. me give you some good advice, okay? Okay. All right, so... Um, what I'm going to rec what you have to realize is um, if you have constipation and you have sludge in the gallbladder, then we know you're deficient in bile. So now you're taking bile salts, which is great, because um, uh, deficiency of bile will cause constipation. If you take too much bile, you'll it'll loosen up everything in your in your gut. So at this point, if you still are constipated with taking the bile salts, I would go to the store and get a laxative, regardless of any type of consideration you have because you've got to keep the bowels going to keep the draining of the, the gallbladder flowing through there. You don't want any stuck flows in your liver or your body. Now, the, the big thing that you're missing is the intermittent fasting because every time you eat, you increase insulin. Insulin is going to 
create more sludge in the gallbladder. What stimulates the bile is saturated fats. So I don't even want you to start adding more fats to this unless you're eliminating and you're going. I think the first step would be do intermittent fasting. Do it, just do two meals a day and try to keep them at 12 and 5, okay, 5 o'clock. I think if you did that, you would have a lot of benefits and you can do the acupressure on the gallbladder too. Then after you're doing intermittent fasting, then start adding a little bit of like egg yolk. And it's not going to create more of a problem. It's going to stimulate your own liver's ability to release the bile. And I would stay with that for a long period of time, keep the vegetables high. The inflammation in your colon that you have is going to be uh, healed as you do intermittent fasting because now you're going to drop insulin and that's going to really speed up the healing of the lining of the colon with the wheatgrass is going to help that support that as well. So those are the answers that I would recommend and thanks, Thank thanks you. Jerry. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Facebook, YouTube, share, share. We're going to help yeah. you next year as much as we can. Have a great New Year. Have We're a great New Year. We're going to see you next year. Okay. <laughs> don't do anything. Don't eat anything I wouldn't eat. Okay. 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 Get right back in the program. All right, guys. Have a great one. Bye.